Hi everybody! Hi everybody! So here's how the pile's looking in. And in this episode, we're reviewing the second book of The Power of Five, Evil Star by Anthony Horowitz. I've already read quite a bit into the series. I had to borrow the fifth and final book, and I'm reading through that now. I'm almost halfway through. So I'm just reading, the, I'm just reviewing these previous books just to get us up to date. And let me tell you, the review for this book will be big, and it will also be part of a series review. That's not what we're doing today. Today, we're doing book two, Evil Star. This episode's Pokemon is... This is a dark energy card. It's kind of fitting. Wazoo, this piece of wood is kind of important. <laughs> Hi! Welcome to Book Reviews Episode 3, Evil Star. For this episode, I've already reviewed in Episode 2, uh, Ravensgate, that's the first in the series. So a strong spoiler warning for Ravensgate, and I will start talking about this. I will give a light spoiler warning when it comes, and it will come, because, um, yeah, that's just kind of the nature of uh, this review and what I want to talk about with this book. Uh, but let's just begin. And assuming you've not read any of these, just for the series, I recommend the series. It is The Power of Five, although I'm currently reading book five of The Gatekeepers. So I guess they rebranded the series. It's being called The Gatekeepers. But the original print didn't call it that. It's The Power of Five series. Power of Five series, I recommend. I would say, I would suggest if you're an older teen... Uh, and you're into, you're okay with some action, some uh, horror, and uh, there is like some gross details. I actually, what I was reading in the last book was kind of gross today. For Evil Star, Evil Star specifically. So after the events of Raven's Gate, Matthew, who is one of the, the five gatekeepers, this ancient force that was uh, defeated 10,000 years ago, as, uh, is threatening to break loose on the modern setting of the mid-2000s. First, in Ravensgate, there was a gate that held them back in Yorkshire, and Matthew somehow managed to just about stop that gate from opening again. Although, they find out that there's a second gate, Evil Star, and it is in South America, in Peru. So the beginning of the book is basically Matthew grappling with his new responsibilities. His friend that he made along the way, the journalist, Richard. RICHARD! Richard is with him. He's now like his new guardian, as Matt doesn't have anyone else. Uh, aside from the Nexus gui guiding him, who are on his side, they're against the old ones. Grapple with the idea that they need to go to Peru and find this other gate and stop anyone from opening it. Matthew is, he's been very reluctant, reluctant so far, but now that he's gone through the fire that was Ravensgate, he realizes his own responsibility, and although he's not very happy with it, and again, uh, with the spoiler warning for the first book, he doesn't know how to use his powers yet. So after that whole book, he still doesn't really know how to use them. And that continues in this book. He's still unsure, he's still grappling, and um, there's four other kids that could be anywhere in the world that he needs to find to come together so that they can defeat the old ones. But this is about preventing the old ones from coming through this second gate. So they arrive in Peru, and all hell breaks loose, basically. Uh, the agents of the old ones, even though they've not come out, are still everywhere through the corrupt police. There's, there's some crazy uh, power that uh, some companies have in South America and Central America. Think of like the Banana Republics. And the main antagonist of this book is one of those big CEOs of this company that's pervasive and expansive and uh, has links with the police and the government, Mr. Salaman. So he is the guy who's trying to open this second gate. There's a race for Matt and Richard to find the gate before Salamander does. And so this book follows that story. Yeah, so that's basically what the aim of the book is. And it's really hard not to get into, like, spoiler territory. Uh, I know I kind of described the first bit, but that first bit isn't really spoilery. It's kind of what it's all all infers anyway. That's the, the setup. Uh, yeah, it's, it's difficult to talk about. If you don't want to get any spoilers, 
This book is of great quality. The writing is just as good. It's, it's kind of strange the, the tone that it takes because obviously it's still set in this series, but the tone that was set in the first book was way more gory and horrific and supernatural. Witches and these spells and the old ones taking control of, of cars and, and reanimating skeletons, having these zombie dogs and stuff like that. Whilst in this one, it doesn't actually lean on that. It's way lighter on the horror. It's way lighter on the grotesque uh, and the supernatural. Instead, it's more of a action thriller, trying to get through Peru, hiding from the police, trying to find out information and, you know, blending in. And when I think about that, I have dreams like that all the time, so I don't know if this book series, when I read it as a young teen, just kind of instilled itself in, it, in my nightmares, where I'm just constantly being chased by, like, some sort of oppressive force. But that's what it is, and it's still just as tense. It has a lot of uh, intensity, and it still has some grittiness and uh, maturity in it. But, again, it is way more grounded. It continues the series in a more realistic setting, so... I feel like this brought a bunch of supernatural elements into it, the first book, and then this kind of grounded it again, but still kept up a good, consistent quality with the writing, with the, the story, the twists and turns. And when I think back on this book, it doesn't feel like too much has happened. It feels way more toned down, and I feel like the pacing is in fact a little bit slower too. Yet when I try and think and recall through all the events, I realize that a lot actually did happen. This book is packed full of stuff, but it just doesn't feel quite as breakneck as the first one does, nor as supernatural or shocking. But it's still really well written, and I still really enjoyed the story, and it added and expanded a lot to the world, I think. Being set in a different country, and coming up against new characters, and with the whole police force having a hand in, in the government and stuff like that, and having it being set in a, in, in, in a place where it has more notoriety for corruption, actually paints a massive precedent for what we see in later books, uh, which obviously I didn't appreciate as much uh, first time reading it, but it still added to the atmosphere in the first book where it felt like the forces were everywhere and they were all around us and you could easily get smothered and, uh, and suffocated and cut off, uh, just like the big theme of isolation in the first book. Here, there's a, a big theme of entrapment, being on the run and being framed. Yeah, those are more general thoughts and overview. And I suppose this isn't quite a spoiler, so this is the last thing I'm going to say before we enter into spoiler territory. So the story, relatively, <laughs> compared to the craziness of the first book, is relatively chill. There's still gun fights and a bunch of stuff happening, sneaking missions. It's way more chill until the end of the book, where it just throws everything at you. The most insane thing happens. I don't, I think, through the rest of the series, the ending of this book is one of the more insane things. Not the most gross or, like, or gritty, but it's, it's up there in terms of how crazy and how shocking it is. And compared to how chill the rest of the book is, it feels like they intentionally toned it down, the ending just like blows you away, and then you're like, oh shoot, I gotta read the next book. And you're like, oh yeah, I'm enjoying myself, it's still really good and keeping me involved. And then you read the ending and you're like, woo, what's the, what's the next book called? I have to find out what happened. And so the pacing of this book is really strange. It kept my attention the whole way through, but it wasn't like in its fist, it wasn't clenching or holding me. I felt pretty relaxed reading it all. It was still somewhat intense and stuff, but the ending blows you away. And so in some ways, it's not as consistent as the first book when we talk about it in context of the, the series, but it's still really good. And so I'm gonna get into a light spoiler warning now. A light spoiler warning! Watch out! Never get the video! Exactly. Um, yeah. When Matt arrives in Peru, he runs into a little bit of trouble with a street urchin named Pedro. Steals his watch or something like that. You know, Matt's annoyed and then Matt tries to meet up with Richard because they got separated at a hotel and a police captain is waiting there for him. And Matt's like, oh, can you 
help me, I'm a lost English schoolboy. And then the captain just starts beating Matt. He just blah, 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 blah. Um, because he's he's a corrupt and he's working for Salamander, basically. And then Pedro comes to the rescue and helps him. And, and they manage to escape off together. And they go to the favela, the slum, a mud town it's called. Because I think it was built on the wake of a mudslide. And uh, Pedro is one of the five. So they manage to, to come together. I think Pedro's parents died in a mudslide. And then it's called Mud Town. So I think there's an implication that he's living in the slum that's built on top of the tragedy that killed his parents. Pedro doesn't speak English. And so another reason why my heart rate was lower when I was reading this. It was still so interesting because basically... Um, yeah, Richard isn't in this book too much. It's mostly Matt and Pedro, two of the five gatekeepers, running and hiding from the police and trying to find Salamander and retrieve the special diary uh, that a monk wrote that basically explains everything about the old ones, where the second gate is and how to open it. So that's something that everybody's trying to get a hold of. Yeah, they're trying to get it back from Salamander, so that's kind of what Matt and Pedro are trying to do. But they can't speak to each other um, because uh, Pedro doesn't know English and Matt doesn't know Spanish. I've not mentioned this in the past review. One special thing about the gatekeepers, well, there's a few things. I'd say there's like three things, but I'll mention two. One, they have special powers, and two, they have a dream world that connects them. So they have this uh, grayscale dream world of this strange landscape, and it shows very abstract signs. And it's not sort of like beautifully, artfully metaphorical. Sometimes it's just weird. It's, 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 it's a really good dream world. With dreams, it's like they never get what they want. And although the dream world is supposed to help them and give them warnings, it's always really abstract. A palm tree is, is warning about a catastrophic event. Or there's a cowboy who is aggressive and flexes his muscles. Uh, and he's just like aggressive to you. And that's a sign about something. And it's always like so abstract it's like sometimes you're like i think i know what this might mean but it's not so in your face like oh and there's a a cloud above and there's a cloud and, and it represents depression it's not like that it's very like wacky and weird like a real dream when matt and pedro both go to sleep they find each other in the dream world and they can speak to each other there there's no language barrier and so it's really interesting to see Matt and Pedro, these two boys from completely different lifestyles. So it's interesting to see them together and them not really being able to speak or communicate. They still find a way to communicate, but then they can actually have lengthy discussions and get to know each other in the dream world. And it's just Anthony Horowitz seems to like to do a lot of research and he does a lot of uh, multinational, multi globe trotting adventures, like I say. So uh, he pulls a little bit from a lot of cultures and languages. So it seems that he does do quite a bit of research, uh, and that does churn out. I mean, there's some things you could critique about it, I suppose, but I think it's nice that when Matthew, an English boy, goes to Peru, he needs to blend in with their culture. I think that's kind of a cool thing. And then also, although the police force is corrupt and working for Salamander and working for the old ones, they find the Incas, which are the, the uh, Native American people of that region, and Anthony Horowitz, he, he gives them representation. And although it's in a fictional story and such, he paints the native people of South America as having been persecuted and having their culture and people being destroyed, which is what happened. And then in this context, he paints them as the people who are wise on healing and wise on the knowledge of uh, the evil ones. And they they see through a lot of the, the modern day evil that colonized society just sees as normal or sees as, or isn't actually fully addressing like corrupted police force and stuff like that and you can see that in north america as well as south america and other regions and so the incas are that they use bow and arrow and spear and also some guns and they fully support the gatekeepers and they help out matt and pedro big time and pedro has a very close connection to them which i won't uh, mention, but it's pretty cool. There's some good native representation there, and I really like the idea of the natives of that region of South America are uh, included and are also a big part of the story, and also are wise healers and fighters uh, for the side of good. I think that's an awesome 
use that that when they go to Peru, they are actually using the native people there because a big issue I feel like with the North with the Americas in general is people forget and skip over and don't actually represent um, the Native Americans here. Like in Canada, I was unaware of all the issues and of their their current cultural prevalence uh, until I moved here. And a lot of Canadians are, are figuring that out too. And they've been treated horribly, horribly, and they still are in, in, in many ways. And so it's just great to see a English writer from the mid-2000s writing in a South American tribe as an important and strong faction on the side of good in this story of modern day evil versus good. Awesome. I just really love Matt and Pedro's character dynamic a lot, and I feel like this carries the book much, and it expands and elaborates on what Matt is willing to do. It makes him inherit the role of this gatekeeper, this person who needs to ward off evil more, because he's having to trust in Pedro, he's having to disguise himself, he's having to evade the police and sneak around a country he's never been in before. When before he was a very reluctant character, he begins this book as a reluctant character still, only just beginning to accept that he has to do these crazy things. A little bit like Alex Ryder, but it took him less time to do that. Um, and then at the end of the book, he... Moderate spoiler warning. At the end of the book, he really takes on the role, and he finds out how to use his powers, and he tries to stop the gate from opening. Major spoiler warning. Major spoiler warning. Skip if you don't want to hear how the ending happens. The gate opens, and the old ones escape. And he tries to stop them by himself. Now, the power of five means that they, as strong as they might be, the, the, the gatekeepers, they can be weak, they can be strong, but it doesn't matter how strong they are, they are not strong enough to defeat the old ones by themselves. There, there has to be all five of them. That's a, the major thing with the series, is they're trying to find each other, and the old ones are trying to escape, and then keep them apart. And Matt, by himself, tries to stop the old ones from coming out of the gate, and he injures them, but Matt dies, basically, and Pedro finds out his power is healing, and he saves Matt's life, and then that leaves us at the end of Evil Star, which has been a relatively chill book, Count Evading the Police Chill, and then the ending is these crazy, it's just a, such a crazy scene, that leaves incredible stakes and intensity for the rest of the series to follow. And it's intense. It's intense. Now that the spoiler section is over, what are my what what is my conclusion? This is a very well written book that has a great character dynamic and expands on setting and the character roster of the Power of Five series, following up from the first book, Raven's Gate. It is fairly chill. It's way more laid back and um, not as explicit or gory, or supernatural, as the first book, uh, but then the ending blows you away and, and, and really gets you hooked for the rest of the series. So I would say, overall, this book is a little bit weaker than the first one, but it's still really good. And so what did, they, what did they give the first one? I think I gave it a solid 6. I gave it a solid 6. I would give this one, I think I'm going to give it a solid 5, because... It was really good. I really liked a lot of the elements that it introduced. Uh, but by itself, it was not nearly... It, it didn't really push too much. It, the calm before the storm, in many ways. It was still very engaging. It was still written well. I still really liked the characters they introduced. And I'm really fond of this book, but I just don't feel like it did as much as the rest of the series. But I am really fond of it too, and I really liked Matt and Pedro's character dynamic. Solid 5, and that's still a good rating. This is still a good book, and I think it plays a really good and vital role to the rest of the series. But right, rating it by itself, it is certainly a step below the first book, I think, but I'm very glad that it is what it is, and although it might not be a low point in the series, it's definitely a low in the series that I still really enjoyed, and so I'm going to put it on the shelf just below, Low Girl Meets Boy, and 
that's the end of this episode. Thank you for joining me. Funny how I had the dark energy card for the least dark and least desperate uh, book in the series. So, there we go. Solid five. Solid five.